Hello, my name is Jacob Hopkins, and you are watching The Courageous Nerd, in where we talk about anime. So welcome to The Courageous Nerd YouTube channel. My name is Connor. I'm joined today by uh, Jacob Hopkins. Jacob, how are you doing today? I'm doing amazing today. How are you, sir? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for taking the time to speak today, and I hope everything is uh, going okay in your part of the world. Obviously, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm gathering obviously in the US, but you know, obviously, <laughs> a, a, a whole ocean is separating us. So, yeah. Uh, what gave uh, it away was it my accent. <laughs> oh yeah, it was, it, was, it, it was a hunch. It was a hunch. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, and obviously I'm over here in, in the UK, so we're, we're, we're quite separated, um, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, um, uh, obviously, you know, people would know you for um, a lot of different projects. You know, we were saying before we started the recording, you've actually, you know, you, you've done quite a lot of things uh, in your career so far. Uh, you know, the Goldbergs, True Blood, Amazing World of Gumball, to name just a few. But I suppose kind of before you did any of that, like what was the initial interest in acting for you? Well, there really wasn't a, a deep interest in my, and um, I started when I was like four or five years old. And mm -hmm. at that age, you know, you, you don't know what you want to do with your life. <laughs> but uh, my dad was an actor. So that's how okay. I kind of fell into it, where one day we were running errands together and um, he stopped by his agency and then they took an interest in me. And I had no idea what it was. They asked if I wanted to act. And I was like, yeah, what's acting? And, mm. um, and I was signed on, um, and I've been doing it for 15 years now. I'm, I'm 20 now, well, so it's wow. been a while, yeah. but, uh, mm. but yeah, the interest now has definitely grown where I'm just <laughs> like, all right, this is what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I kind of, I really like that about acting that a lot of the people who are acting like now as adults, they kind of like stumbled into it or like, you know, it wasn't a like, you know end game or goal to be an actor that it just kind of happened in some sense obviously you had to work hard to get to where they are now but like the initial thing it wasn't necessarily calculated which you know I, I think that's really interesting not many professions are really like that yeah man I mean I I, I really did kind of stumble into it it definitely wasn't like a family plan or anything mm. to keep up a legacy or something like that it was just something that I thought at that age you know this could be fun and then I completely fell in love with it and I've been doing it ever since mm. oh for sure yeah and I, I suppose um obviously the shows I mentioned uh you're in the amazing world of Gumball you voice obviously the title uh character in that and I, I know you weren't the first actor to do the voice so I suppose that how was that stepping into uh, a show taking over the lead well, funnily enough, uh, I was a huge fan of the show before I stepped into it. I, sure. I grew up on it when I was like, I think I started watching when I was like nine years old. And when I was 11 was um, when I first started voice acting. Mm. Um, I hadn't done any voice acting prior. It was just purely theatrical on camera work. And, uh, and around age 11, I signed on with a voiceover agent. And my very first audition and role that I booked was Gumball, which... Okay is pretty crazy to say out loud yeah when I really think about it huh. um but it, it was a very it was a very interesting process it, it was hard they 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 took an interest to me when I sent in my audition um but they were like all right you know this kid might be the one we're not sure if he's quite ready for it though so we're going to put him through a series of tests so for like mm. two months two or three months around that time frame I went into the studio to record snippets of episodes, whole episodes, um, episodes that hadn't been released yet. So they were just scripts that, you know, mm. that they hadn't been animated, they hadn't been recorded. And yeah. a couple of those was actually the fan and the shell, um, very early episodes that I would one day record. Mm. Um, and I also had to train myself, you know, I, I knew how to act. Um, I had been acting for like six years at that point. So I already had yeah. that under my belt. But at that point, I was like, well, now I got to learn voiceover. It's a completely different ballpark. You have to yeah, portray it's an all yourself, your emotions yeah. through your voice. Right, exactly. You're not on camera. There's no camera to pick up your body language, you know, your eye, mm. your facial expressions, none of that. So, so I had to learn the technical aspects of voiceover. I had to 
train my voice to actually sustain long sessions of recording. Um, Gumball is super hyperactive. Like mm-hmm. he's, mm-hmm. he yells a lot. He talks really, really fast. He's got a ton of energy and I had to sort of build up that stamina and, um, and it's, it's a blessing, man, because I learned everything I needed to know about voice acting from just doing that show for four years. And I don't think I've really like found myself like learning new things as I've been going on. It, you know, I, it's, it was sort of like a cram session where I had to learn Mm. everything. And then four years of doing it really smoothed out my skills. So it was, it wasn't, I, I view it as like an amazing opportunity to, you know, be on Cartoon Network, be the voice of Gumball, but also just sure. a four-year learning experience, <laughs> I guess you could call it that. Yes. Yeah, and uh, something actually I read about you, and obviously you can't always trust the internet, whether it's right or not, that um, you're a black belt in Taekwondo, is that right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. I'm a, uh, I'm a third-degree black belt, yeah. Mm. yeah I've been doing I, that since I was like nine years old. Mm. I, I also <laughs> did, uh, did, did Taekwondo uh, when I was younger as well, and Without kind of giving ah. too much away of, of how far I got, you would walk the floor with me. I didn't, I didn't get, I didn't get very far. <laughs> but um, I, I moved on to a different martial art. I, I did a little bit better at that one, but yeah, still, you, you would walk the floor with me. So I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, not gonna go there. But I, I suppose like how big of like uh, a role has martial arts played in, like in your career or, or just like generally? Because obviously that's another kind of big uh, commitment, you know, to really go into. You know, especially to oh, get yeah. as far as you have. Oh, yeah. Well, I unfortunately haven't had the ability to, like, use my martial arts in um, anything like uh, like live action or mm-hmm. something like that. I, I want to, though. I, yeah. I, I want to cross my fingers for, like, yeah, DC that'd be cool. yeah. but um, but it has it has taught me a lot of important values just in everyday life. And I could use it in my career, too. And I do it. It's really taught me to humble myself. You know, I can't tell you how many times like over the years in any competitions or sparring matches in my dojo where I've gotten my butt handed to me. You know, Mm. there have been times where, you know, I've definitely won, but there have been a lot of times where I've just been absolutely mopped and it's really humbled myself thinking, you know, I'm not the best. There's always going to be someone better and that's okay because that gives me the opportunity to work for myself and make myself better and reach that level and then Mm. once I get to that level there's going to be someone else better than that so yeah it's it's a continuous um it's a continuous path of growth is how I'd say it Mm. um and that can be viewed in any career it can be viewed not only in acting it can be viewed in just I don't know like engineering tech entrepreneurship anything like that yeah Um, and I, I feel like that's a really important lesson to have learned and I've definitely been incorporating that in my everyday life. Yeah and I think what not uh, what not a lot of people like uh, realize about martial arts is that as well as obviously the fighting aspect is very great for fitness and I'm sure there's there's Mm -hmm. ever like a role for your character to be like really athletic it would be useful for that even if it wasn't martial arts itself. (laughs) <laughs> mm. no for sure i i that would that would be that's the dream that's definitely yeah. the dream be like an uh, an alternate spider-man or something mm-hmm. you know um but yeah man it's it's definitely been a huge part of my life and i i ain't quitting i ain't quitting anytime mm. soon absolutely I, I suppose like in terms of the acting just to kind of go back to that and another kind of aspect of it is it can be very nomadic you kind of move on from one project to the next, and obviously, unless you're a regular in a, in a television series, I guess, be the exception. But I suppose, like, what do you enjoy about that? Kind of like doing something for a little while and then moving on to something else. Is it like freeing? Or like, I mean, like, cause obviously not everyone is able to necessarily do that. You know, some people might be on a, a job. I mean, I've been up with you and Gumble, you're on, on that for quite a while. It's like, what do you enjoy oh, yeah. about going from, from one thing to the next? Well, a lot of people I hear in the industry get like, severe burnout and they they kind of they're they're like glad to move on but that is totally not me i get i get really attached to the characters and um and i remember when i was like 14 15 years old and gumball was coming to an end for me yeah and it 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 like it shocked me i i didn't really i didn't ever think it was gonna end for some reason even though it Mm. totally was because i i'm growing up but (laughs) uh at that time i was like well 
you know, it was really hard. I've been doing it for four years. And I was like, you know, it's, it's a good thing that I did it, but it's also a good thing. It's bittersweet that it's coming to an end because I get to move on to, to other characters and explore them. Cause you know, I, I would have loved to have stayed gumball and not do mm. anything else, but looking yeah. back, you know, that's really not the most healthy thing for an actor or voice actor. It, what, what a lot of us, I, and I don't want to speak for like everyone, but what I crave is exploration. I really like to explore different characters and different levels and layers to what yeah. makes a character a character. And then shortly after, you know, Gumball ended for me, I moved on to Axel Fink, Dragon's Rescue Riders. Yeah. After that, I finally broke my door into the foot of anime. I voiced Fushin to your eternity, Shunkami mm. and Tribe Nine. Um, now I've I just announced um, voicing Code and Boruto and Makoto yeah. Katai and Komi Can't Communicate. So like, <laughs> I'm glad that, you know, I, I've been moving up and up and up because that's that's what I had been looking for. And it's, it's really fun. It's a really fun experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think in some sense, it could be a bit of a double-edged sword. Because obviously you can be on a really exciting job like for, for years in some cases, but then it might kind of shoot you in the foot when you finish it because then people just see you as that character and it could be kind of like, you know, a uh, bit sweet yeah. to, to some extent, yeah. Well, the beauty of voiceover is that, and yeah, I know they do that like happens all the time for theatrical stuff, but the beauty of mm. voiceover is that, you know, it doesn't matter what you look like. It's if yeah. you're like a really talented voice actor and can do a bunch of different kinds of characters, I don't think you would ever really get typecasted. Yeah. You know? um, so, so that, that was, that was really good <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, it, but that's also the exciting part is in voiceover is that, you know, through a lot of hard work and you, you develop these different kinds of voices and techniques, there's a lot of things that you can do with that. And I have yet to do, and I would love to explore much more. I, um, Gumball, I did a lot of like character voices. There had been yeah. a ton of episodes where he turns into completely different people breaking the fourth mm. wall. Um, yeah. There was like JFK, there was Beetlejuice, mm. like there's a ton of different stuff that he would do. Um, so that was like that was a show where I really got to like break out and do a bunch of different characters and yeah but that's and that's what I'm like kind of looking for now is I would love to do something like that and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people would in voice acting world absolutely and I think definitely that looking at your credits there's uh, one that kind of stands out at least when I was looking at them uh, really early on for you was the film Priest and like just even looking at yeah. the, the, the list of <laughs> names in, in that cast I mean Paul Bettany, Stephen Moyer, Carl Urban, Lily Collins. I mean, and that's not even doing it justice. It's stacked. I mean, it, yeah. honestly, if, if, if anyone watching this is interested, go and check out that cast because it, it's insane. And like, <laughs> you, you'd, you'd have been like very, very young, right? When you worked on that. Oh, like, yeah. 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 I mean, a, a kid, like a child, right? Yeah. I was like seven or eight. Yeah. And I had no idea who Paul Bettany was. Didn't mm. even know what I was walking into. Um, I just was completely unaware. But funny enough, I I actually worked with Stephen Moyer like three years later on yeah, True Blood. Blood, and yeah. uh, and we de we definitely remember. Well, we we knew who we were. We didn't have any scenes together in Priest, but we knew that we both worked on that movie, and that was mm. really fun working with him, like for the first time, really, because we didn't have any scenes together in Priest. Mm. Yeah, Priest, man, I was a little baby. I remember, mm. um, <laughs> I remember my, my scene in that movie, for those of you who haven't watched it, is uh, I've, I'm this little boy mm. and Paul Bettany is a, a priest, a vampire hunter, really. And yeah. He's got like this huge crucifix tattoo on his forehead and I'm looking up at him and like everyone else is super scared of him, but I'm not because I'm a child and I don't know any better. And I look up and I'm like, mm. did it hurt? And I'm referencing his tattoo. Mm. And, um, and the scene goes I ask him that and he just stares and doesn't respond and then like I walk away and he quietly whispers to himself like yes right all brooding and stuff but <laughs> when, we were, <laughs> when we were shooting it um yeah. I was like did it hurt and he just stares <laughs> and my mom's like come on honey and we walk away and they yell cut and he goes like of course it did everyone starts <laughs> laughing and I'm like looking around like what's happening who's Paul Bettany <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, and I, I, it's insane looking at like some of those actors' more recent credits because, like, you know, who can say they've been in a film with Vision, Billy Butcher, and, and <laughs> Emily in yeah. Paris? It's just like, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's I, nuts. I mean, yeah. it's weird thinking about that now. Like, I've also worked with Elizabeth Banks on this one. Um, it, it was this. It was the short. Um, I think it was something called like catch a heart attack something i do with a heart it was like a heart attack psa sure and yeah. um even at that time i didn't know who elizabeth banks was hmm. <laughs> it's weird looking back on that path but it's also it's it's very it's very humbling too like wow i've you know i've been doing this for like 15 years ever since i was like a toddler and hmm. i've and i've gotten the pleasure to work with a ton of amazing people all super super nice really great people absolutely yeah i just kind of um I mean, to use a, a, a bit of a, um, like a similar theme, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, in that you've, you've mentioned uh, Dragon's Rescue Riders. Obviously, that's a spin-off of uh, How to Train Your Dragon, very, very popular DreamWorks film. And you're also in uh, the middle school films, the middle school worst years of your life, which were based on a book. So I suppose, like, how was kind of acting in something that was based on oh, yeah. a, a, ex existing properties? Yeah. With middle school, um, I... I hadn't read the books when I was cast, but I started yeah. to like when I was working while I was working on the movie, I was reading the books so I could learn more about the character. I play Miller, the killer, yeah, uh, the yeah. bully, essentially mm -hmm. just a horrible person in the books. He's <laughs> irredeemable. But in the movie, <laughs> he's much, much better. <laughs> but uh, yeah, in Rescue Riders, that was like totally a dream come true i grew up reading all of the how to train your dragon books still mm. read them to this day huge fan yeah. um and being in that world is super cool axel's a really fun character to play too i i sort of describe him as like the harley quinn of the show mm. where he's constantly being pulled back and forth by the sides of good and evil and that's a really that's a really fun um that's a really fun thing to play, especially with a character like Axel who's like a con man, you know, you never know yeah. what he's going to do next. He's unpredictable, which is super duper fun to play. Um, and I get to work with a bunch of amazing people, uh, Brendan Lee Brown, mm. um, Zach Callison, you know, Nicholas Cantu, a bunch of awesome voice actors um, mm -hmm. directed by Mary E. McGlynn, which is super yeah. cool. She directed Cowboy Bebop. <laughs> so I was like, dude, this yeah. world is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I know like another uh, long running role you have, and it's more on like the live action side, but you play uh, Chad Cramp on the Goldbergs for mm -hmm. uh, ABC. And I suppose, because obviously if anyone doesn't know the show, it's it's based on the creator's, you know, childhood and uh, I guess teen life growing up, uh, Adam Goldberg that is. and. Obviously, you know, Chad Cramp was a real person that Adam Goldberg knew. So I suppose, does playing a character that was based on a real person affect how you play the character, if that makes any sense? I It definitely does. It, it, mm. it It's weird to kind of, like, copy the real person to a T. It, you sort of have to put your own kind of spin on it. Um, yeah. But I've actually met the real chad cramp like yeah. many many times and he even plays my he, dad in the, show. in the show yeah yeah so so he's i would say i i hope i stay true to him um mm -hmm. he's he's basically just like <laughs> chad's gonna listen to this and hate me mm -hmm. but chad is basically the uh the your classic boy next door super kind charming right um he's very very sweet you know just a stand-up guy and um and he's the, he's like the straight man. And then, you know, Adam is just the the dork, you know, the, mm. the lovable goof that um, is always getting into all kinds of trouble. And Chad kind of has to be the one that's like, all right, listen, you know, maybe this isn't such a good idea. But then he kind of gets caught up in it anyways, because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so that so that was basically their childhood. And we get to actually play that. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite things doing in the Goldbergs, though, is just what the show does and it's hilarious is that whenever they have like a chatham episode the chad sure. and adam yeah. dynamic right they at the end do a tag where it shows like the side-by-side -side comparison of the home movies that they made on a camcorder in yeah. the 80s together and then we mm -hmm. act them out <laughs> <laughs> so those are really fun i think my favorite might be the uh the cornflakes commercial that they did yeah 
I don't know why they did a cornflakes commercial, but then we mm-hmm. reenacted it, and that was stupid, but it was awesome. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, I, I, I think that's another one as well. Where like, have you been appearing in that since like season one, or, or definitely you were in it quite early, weren't you? Oh yeah, yeah. season one, I think, and it was uh, the Kremps is what the episode was called. Yeah, yeah, uh, where we first meet, and Adam, Adam doesn't really have a whole lot of friends yet, and sure. um, yeah. Chad is one of the first friends he meets, and and this is a real thing mm-hmm. that Adam did. But he was in his front yard, like he transformed his bicycle into a light cycle from Tron. And yeah. I walk over and I'm like, oh, is that Tron? It's cool. You know, I've seen mm. it like 16 times. What's up, man? And so mm. we we just hit it off. And that's really what happened. And that's yeah. I, I think that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause I think definitely with projects like that, you wonder like what's like, you know, complete fiction and what is like inspired by, by real life. And I suppose obviously having the real Chad in such close like proximity, you know, almost to say, yeah, that happened. Oh no, that's completely made up. Like, you know, I don't know where that came from. But yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we take some creative liberties, but I, I feel like we we stay true to his life. <laughs> mm. uh, uh, absolutely. And oh, obviously you've also mentioned that you've made a leap into anime and you know you mentioned like you know yes. some projects you've done like yourself, obviously uh Treble Nine, you, uh, you mentioned uh Prince of Tennis mm. as well. Um but yeah. any kind of like uh, like stand out uh, you know to you like personally that you've done i think um a prince of tennis uh will definitely stand out to me for years to come uh mm-hmm. that that is like and i did know this when i was auditioning because the anime is actually older than me but it wow. is okay. the longest running sport shown in anime and mm. so definitely that's always going to stay with me <laughs> we're still recording not not even like a quarter done with like the original series and we're doing a new series now um it's the u17 world cup so that's really fun um but i feel like the one that will always resonate with me is um to your eternity voice and fushi and that that was the first anime that i actually booked um i remember last year in 2021 Mm-hmm. I, uh, I, that's when I started auditioning for anime. I was like, I want to branch out of that. And it took like six months of just auditioning. But after that, yeah. I, I got Fushi and, um, and man, dude, if you, if, for those of you who haven't watched that show, that is definitely not for the, for the faint of heart. That is right. a tragedy. It won best drama in the Crunchyroll mm. awards. It is heart wrenching. It's so sad, but it it's, it's got, so many great moments in it too it it really it's a show that really reminds you like we're not going to live forever and you never know how much time you have with the people you love Mm. and it's and 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 that really resonates with me in my personal life you know you know I've gone through some stuff you know we all have you know yeah but yeah but that that specifically that message is so beautiful for me personally to play and I'm really fortunate and, and grateful that I have. Mm-hmm. And we're coming back for a second season this fall. Oh, wow. uh, and, it, right. and it is fall. It's, it, we're yeah. going into September, so it should be soon. <laughs> um, I don't know exactly when, but it's this fall this year for sure. Um, and yeah, man, it, Fushi is such a great character. Always, mm-hmm. always, always going to be like my, my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I've, I've definitely gathered from what you're saying. So that, did the desire to move into anime as an actor come from being a fan of anime? Yes, for sure. I mm. grew up on Dragon Ball when I was a little kid. Uh, I used to watch like the Nicktoons version, <laughs> which <laughs> is pretty bad because they censor and take out so much of it. Um, yeah. So I was like, when I got older, I was like, all right, let's get the DVDs. <laughs> um, but yeah, dude, I and, and that's sort of like, created my love for martial arts as well as partially the reason I started Taekwondo too at such a young age yeah. and I remember growing up on like Dragon Ball Z Kai um and I was like I, I want to do that hmm. and for a while I I hadn't really branched out to it because I didn't really know how um it's it's like a it's sort of like a, a bubble you know it's it's well, now it's not Funimation anymore. It's confused in a crunchy roll. But back then it was Funimation and it was yeah. located in Dallas, Texas. And that's where you like had to be if you wanted to do anime. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when the pandemic hit, they they started branching out to doing remote recording. Yeah. And if there is 
any silver lining that if there's any like glimmer of anything good that happened during those couple of years, it was mm. definitely that because I, that's, you know, that's how a lot of people were able to break into that bubble and, you know, myself included, I wouldn't yeah. have been able to do it if it wasn't for that. So, so there's that, there, there's yeah. that little, that little happiness. Um, <laughs> but Hey, <laughs> you know, it happened and, and I'm grateful for it. It's been a blast. For sure, absolutely, and I suppose it's kind of like, you know, like generally speaking, because like being the age that you are, you you came up in acting. I think at a really interesting time. Obviously, the age of like social media was happening in parallel yeah. to like you starting acting, and obviously you've got like quite a a large following uh, across like you know different platforms like Instagram, uh, Twitter, and like so on and so forth. I suppose like, how does that tie into kind of growing as an actor while also having this platform? It's definitely a way to create a more like deeply knitted fan base. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like before social media, you know, there, there was definitely huge fan bases for like A-list actors and voice actors Absolutely. and cartoons yeah. and stuff. But with social media, it gives people the chance to kind of interact with them and like keep up on their sort of daily um, career, you know, like what, yeah. what they're working on you know, what their, what, what their next project is. And, and that, and that also, I feel like helped um, sort of grow my, my career in the voiceover world. Um, I, I actually um, had booked like a couple of stuff because Mm. of like a demo that I had put out on Twitter. Um, So that, it, it, it helps like branch out networking, you know, mm. but also just creating that fan base, you know, they're going to be with you for a long, long time and you yeah. get to interact with them. And that's really cool. Um, it's, it's really cool that people like care that much, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's awesome. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I, I imagine there's probably people who like know you from voiceover who like just want to put a face to the voice and might kind of seek you yeah. out because of that like, oh, I wonder what the guy who, who voices the character is actually like to see what he's all about and oh he is his Instagram is his Twitter you know yeah no dude for sure I it's you definitely you definitely face that in the voice acting world where you know it, and you know this is thankfully for me um hmm. I don't I don't want to speak for anyone else but uh sure. but I you don't as a voice actor you don't get really recognized that much and for me I'm like yeah good <laughs> but uh <laughs> So, but it also is like, they don't, yeah, you're right. They don't have a, a face to put with the voice. They know what you sound like, but who mm. are you, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, and social media definitely helps with that too. Um, and uh, doing like conventions and stuff is really fun. To, and that, that's like the big, the biggest chance to, to interact with the fan base. And I actually have a convention coming up in January, I believe in St. Oh. Petersburg uh florida so hey any floridians Mm. (laughs) um but yeah man it's it's definitely a very useful tool uh gotta use it responsibly though yeah because there's a lot of people that abuse it um Mm. but yeah man it's it's tricky but uh it's tough to navigate but hey it's it's the business now you know Mm. yeah and I, i think definitely and obviously i'm not in anyone's like in a circle to know this officially, but there's bound to be actors where they've kind of been told at this point that you kind of need to get out there on these platforms if you want to yeah. kind of, you, know, you see that like people say like, oh, I'm never going to go on social media. And then like a year, two years later, you know, well, there they are, you know, something changed. Right. And, yeah. Right. Now the, the um, uh, Thomas Ian Griffith, I remember the guy who plays uh, Silver and yeah. Cobra Kai, he, mm-hmm. he created an Instagram because of Cobra Kai yeah (laughs) it's like interesting it's it's weird to think about because it's like he never would have done that but Mm. it when something is as popular as cobra kai you know yeah you got to do it Mm. it's like it's that's the way it is you know yeah and obviously like he originally played that character in in the karate kid three so like people would already like been very familiar who he is and so like i'm sure a lot of his followers might have known him just from that before even appeared on Cobra Kai yeah for sure oh yeah definitely yeah absolutely yeah and I suppose obviously in terms of like yourself like away from acting um that you serve as a celebrity ambassador for the Jonathan Foundation and I was reading a bit about that it sounds really interesting but I suppose if you want to kind of explain 
what that entails for anyone who hasn't heard about it. Yeah, of course. The Jonathan Foundation is an incredible organization. It's led by Raja Mahaba, the founder. And yeah. uh, what she and her team does essentially is they get the proper IEPs for people with uh, learning disabilities, um, any neurological disorders, you know, um, and anything, anything that would hinder their education. You yeah. know, uh, it, it's not just, um, you know, learning disabilities. It's, I remember hearing a story told by the foundation that there was actually a guy who had like a sweat gland disorder and okay. it affected his, um, it affected his education essentially. Mm. Like he couldn't really stay in class to learn. So they were able to help him get the proper assessments um, to develop uh, an education plan that worked best for him. Oh. And, and that's what they do for all of these, you know, children and young adults. And I, for, I want to say for like nine years now, I've been a celebrity youth ambassador for them. Well, not yeah. youth anymore. I guess yeah, I'm just cool. celebrity ambassador. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, I have the pleasure of essentially spreading the word, you know, using my platform to yeah. promote, you know, what they do, any events that they hold. I attend their events. Um, I promote them in you know podcasts and interviews like this you know yeah um and it's definitely changed so many lives um it's changed lives in in my family yeah. um oh, and cool. it's it's a blessing uh when when i go to their annual events you know they have all these different people that go up and speak and talk about yeah. all the how, essentially how their lives were changed you know they went from not being able to learn anything because they had been sort of conditioned by these school districts to to hate school you mm -hmm. know and and then they because they didn't they didn't get the help that they wanted so right. essentially so in their minds they're like okay well no one's helping me so why should i even care but then mm -hmm. a Jonathan Foundation steps in, gets their proper education plan, gets them back on track, and and they they love school again, and uh, and it's I feel like that's really important. You know, we gotta love our education. We gotta love to learn. Mm -hmm. We gotta want to learn. You know, yeah, want to do it. Um, and I'm really happy to be a part of that and to and to spread that message. Yeah, no, I mean honestly, like it sounds, it sounds like a really fantastic cause, and obviously, like you know, good for you for. Thank you, know, you. Being Thank being so involved in it, absolutely, yeah. Um, it's actually the last question I had prepared, and it's just kind of like in, in a wider sense, um, like what can people expect from from, from you? Like, I guess coming up in in the near future, is there anything you've done recently that you know you, you might like to, I guess, highlight or you know? Yes, a <laughs> yeah. couple of things. Um, I, so I think I did mention that we have a new installment of uh, Prince of Tennis. Um, it's on Crunchyroll. It's the U17 yeah. World Cup. Um, and then I also mentioned that Fushi uh, To Your Eternity season two is coming yeah. out this fall very soon. Um, but I recently, like yesterday, um, this is being recorded on August 31st. So yeah. uh, August 30th is when I finally was able to announce my involvement in Boruto. I voice code the next main antagonist. And I'm really, really excited about that. Mm -hmm. He's so evil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm really looking forward to like what we get to see him do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's out now. I believe you can get it on Amazon as well as like the, the box set number 13, I believe. So, cool. yeah. And then also I was able to literally just today, August 31st, announce that I voice Makoto Katai in yeah. Kobe Can't Communicate. I love that character. He's basically this super tall, jacked guy that looks like a thug, but right. in reality, he just wants to look tough so no one makes fun of him, and he just wants to make some friends. He's like oh. a total sweetheart. <laughs> and that's really fun to play, and that's on Netflix. Yeah. Uh, I believe the first episode came out today, so yeah, be sure to check that oh. out. For sure. I mean, that all sounds, you know, fantastic, and I guess just to say, you know, best of luck with everything going Thank forward you. You, know, you. you know with acting with with the uh, jonathan foundation and just you know all the best take care and, and stay safe awesome thank you you as well thank you for having me <laughs>